Welcome to Your Fantastic Mind. I'm Jay Watson. This is a show where we explore the mysteries and the science of the amazing human brain. 22 million Americans have a common but significant health issue, sleep apnea. It's when the upper airway becomes blocked repeatedly during sleep, reducing or completely stopping airflow. You stop breathing. What's lesser known is that children with Down syndrome are at huge risk for this condition. One of those children is Cassie Vanderberg, and as you're about to see, she joined a clinical trial to help her own severe case of sleep apnea. Okay, you ready? Go. Cassie is a lot of fun. She's crazy and silly. Constant movement and laughter <laughs> fill Cassie Vanderberg's days. She lights up a room when she comes in, and people are very, they love her. Yeah. <laughs> but she's a handful. <laughs> When you can get her to sit still. So what, are, what are we here to talk to you about? Uh, about, like, things. She knows about the things, fire. or right. thing, we are here to talk about. <laughs> Cassie was an extremely restless sleeper uh, all over the bed at night. She would end up in bed with me sometimes, or vice versa, and I just thought, how in the world can this girl be getting any sleep because it was so um, just all over the place all night and a lot of snoring um, and I would actually hear do this sort of stopping breathing and a big gasp and so um, I started to figure that something was going on that probably needed to be checked. You know hearing her stop breathing at night to hear your child stop breathing at night for a mom it's very scary. A person with sleep apnea when they're sleeping, uh, they're breathing in, and then so they breathe in, and they breathe out, and before they breathe in again, they choke. Okay, so it's right at the onset of inspiration, right when they're about to take a breath in, the airway's too collapsed and they just can't, they meet resistance and they choke. 60% of children with Down syndrome have sleep apnea, periodic interruptions in your breathing during sleep. Emory Brain Health Director of Sleep Surgery, Dr. Raj Dedia. And that happens over and over again. Uh, anytime, anywhere between five times an hour for, for adults, we say that up to over 100 times an hour where patients are choking while they're sleeping. In Cassie's case, her sleep apnea was severe, her tongue falling back and blocking her airway, common in children with Down syndrome. <laughs> Dr. Nikila Raoul is a pediatric otolaryngologist at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Most commonly we see is that their tongue is too big for, essentially too big for their mouth. Um, and so with that, combined with that low muscle tone, it tends to flop back at night. In this sleep study video from Emory, Cassie looks to be asleep, but her brain waves show she only sleeps 53% of the entire night. The Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Machine, or CPAP, which sends a constant flow of airway pressure to the throat to keep it open, did not work for Cassie, who wouldn't keep it on. Sleep apnea can have profound negative impacts on health above and beyond fatigue. It puts you at a higher risk for high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes, heart arrhythmia, depression, and early death. And as they started talking to me about it, it sounded kind of wild. It is Inspire, a surgically implanted stimulator to treat sleep apnea. A pacemaker-like device is implanted in the chest. It senses when breathing slows down and sends an electrical pulse to the tongue to stimulate it forward, keeping the airway open. With Inspire, what it does is as they are about to breathe in and during the whole inspiration part of the breath cycle, the tongue is basically protruding. So when they're sleeping at night, when they breathe in, breathe out, it relaxes, breathe in. She was really the ideal candidate. She was the youngest patient that we implanted at the time she was implanted. Um, so she was 10 at the time. Already FDA approved to treat adults, Inspire is in a trial stage to treat children with Down syndrome. Children's Healthcare of Atlanta partnered with Emory Brain Health as one of five places in the country to be part of the trial. Dr. Dedia has already implanted Inspire in 70 adult patients. 
The incision is made usually on the right side, underneath the jawline, and we find the nerve that controls the tongue. That's called the hypoglossal nerve. Once we find the nerve, we dissect the nerve out, and we put a small 10 millimeter cuff, wrap it around the nerve. And that's what allows the tongue to move because we've got those nerve branches under the stimulation field. Then we put in the implant implantable pulse gener generator, which is really the pacemaker. That goes in the upper chest on the right side. And the third incision is bound by the rib cage, where we put a little pressure sensor that detects changes in the pressure of the rib cage area. This video from Cassie's two-hour outpatient surgery shows Inspire being activated and her tongue sticking out. That image signaled the change of her life and that of her mother's. It's been a big change, a huge change for Cassie. Her breathing is quiet. Um, I don't hear those gaps in breathing. I don't hear the loud snoring. It's just been amazing to me to know that that fear has been almost lifted from me now because she's sleeping well. It's just a, you know, it's a noticeable difference for all of us, really. Okay, just hold still for now. A remote control turns Inspire on at bedtime. Whenever her tongue begins to fall into the back of her throat, Inspire stimulates the nerve to make it stick out instead, keeping her airway open. In the morning, the remote turns Inspire off. It turns white and it's on. You got it. Okay, yay! Cassie is more active than ever. For the first time in many years, she's also rested. So is her mom. Cassie. At her checkup, Inspire, which is Bluetooth connected, gives her doctors a readout of its use. Right now, Cassie is one of just 23 children with Down syndrome in the country to get Inspire. But makers say they're working with the FDA to make it broadly available to children. When I offer this to these patients, I actually am confident that I have the, something that can probably cure their sleep apnea. One thing is certain, this device I love your TV. is perfectly named for a girl who inspires those around her. When's the last time you had a look inside your brain? For most of us, the answer is never, unless we are seeking answers to a health issue. But what if you could have a peek inside your brain? What would you be able to learn and see? We follow journalist Jerry Grillo, who did this and whose story has a twist he didn't expect. We can go for a walk, we can go for a hike. Tucked into the side of a curving mountain road, some 90 miles north of Atlanta, Jerry and Jane Grillo have spent two decades carving out a life, raising their now grown daughter and 17-year-old son, Joe. Still hungry? Yes. Okay. That was good. Breakfast of champions. That's right. Joe has cerebral palsy. Jerry is a writer, and it was his job that brought us together five months before this mountain visit. The words that keep going through my head are, this should be interesting. Jerry had come to Emory Brain Health as part of a story he was writing on brain research. He was going to do something most people don't get to do, experience a look inside his brain by getting an MRI. I want to be able to go inside the torpedo tube and um, be able to write from that perspective. This is a really wonderful opportunity. Scary on the one hand, but, um, but a great chance on the other hand to help with a story that I want to tell. Jerry's fear comes from watching people he loves get MRIs. His son, Joe, after seizures, and Jerry's dad, not long before he died from cancer at 58, the same age Jerry is now. My brothers and I always have this little thing. One brother's already past 58, another one's behind me. When my brother turned 58, I, said, I called him, I said, the clock's running. <laughs> I would like to know about if you're a healthy guy, like your age, if you're healthy, if you exercise, mm -hmm. and if you have a family history of any brain stuff. Sure. Um, well, uh, knock on wood, I don't think we have a history of any brain stuff. Hey, how are you? Hey, Dr. Long. Jerry Grillo. Hey, Jerry. MRIs are usually for people seeking answers to a health issue. They're not usually for curious writers willing to be a guinea pig for the sake of a story. The chief operating system of my body, you know, what's happening in there when, um, when I'm breathing and doing all the things I take for granted. Hey, Jerry, how you doing? 
All right. So for the next 10 minutes, I need you to just open your eyes and focus on the plus sign, okay? This is actually measuring the connection between the two hemispheres of the brain. So this is what he's hearing. That's how loud it is in there. <laughs> Hi, Jerry, how are you doing? I'm gonna put on a video. You can watch it or you can close your eyes, okay? All right, here we go. Hey, Jerry, how are you doing? So these set of scans is going to be about 15 minutes to go. Okay. It's a little louder than the previous ones. How is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> Jerry spends almost an hour getting his MRI, magnetic resonance imaging scan, a test that uses powerful magnets to make detailed pictures of the brain. Emory neurologist Dr. James Law translates the images for Jerry. Wow. Looks brand new, like it's never been used. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Law tells Jerry he has a healthy looking brain, that both sides of his brain have symmetry. People talk about the gray matter of the brain, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's really that outside strip uh -huh. um, is your gray matter. And this is um, also probably the only time you ever want the adjective plump used to describe you, because otherwise it's never a flattering <laughs> adjective. <laughs> um, but you want your folds of brain tissue to be nice and full and plump. He tells Jerry that microscopic changes in the brain, such as those with Alzheimer's disease, cannot be seen on a scan, which is why people get lumbar punctures to withdraw spinal fluid. And the brain is basically bathing in that stuff, right? So it's floating in this fluid, which is actually made in some of these tissues. Scientists can measure the levels of amyloid protein and tau protein in spinal fluid. Both are hallmark proteins in the pathology of Alzheimer's. The meeting between Law and Grillo ends as it begins. Your brain might be drop dead gorgeous, but then it may not be working so great. You have so. obviously have read some of my writings. <laughs> Nine days after this jovial exchange, Dr. Law's words will seem foreboding. I was sitting here on the couch, just a normal Sunday. I heard this sharp buzzing in my, it felt like the right side of my uh, ear, mm -hmm. like I've never experienced or heard before, you know, and I knew it was something because it immediately made me started going. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's how, that's what happened. And I kind of started lilting to port and, um, Asked Jane, please get me an aspirin. I think this might be a stroke because I had written about it years earlier. At home, on his couch, Jerry had a stroke. You were still vomiting. It was a cerebellar stroke. After three days in a North Georgia hospital, he was sent home. Five months later, hey, hey how Jerry, you doing? How good to see you. Good, good man. See you. Yeah. He and Dr. La meet again. In the grand scheme of things, the kind of stroke that you had, if, uh, if you had to choose one, that might be near the top of your list. Jerry Cerebellar stroke is one of the less common types of stroke. It happens when a blood vessel is blocked or bleeding, causing complete interruption to a portion of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the portion of the brain that controls movement and maintains balance. It's located at the back of your brain, at the bottom. We know it was a clot. We're not a hundred. I have a. We have installed a loop recorder in Just my to chest make sure to that make you sure. Don't have any yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. To make sure that there's nothing happening there. You know, I always say that when it comes to uh, to damage to the brain, mm -hmm. the same three rules apply as the the first three rules of real estate. You remember those? Uh, uh, location, location, location. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> exactly. So how is it that Jerry's brain looked fine one day? Yet the next scan, taken nine days later, shows a brain now damaged by a stroke. Quite simply, our brains, like our very day-to-day -day lives, are unpredictable. And just because something is okay today, doesn't mean it will be tomorrow. Dr. La gives the silver lining. Jerry's recovery um, tells you that in fact the brain can be quite resilient. He's right. With the exception of some mild weakness in one hand, Jerry's feeling like his old self, 
I feel like mostly I'm I'm back. I can I can do tree pose. You know, uh, you know I could I could do the balance exercises I need to do. Sometimes the fear, probably unfounded as it is, as most fear is, um, but comes from a real place. Sometimes that gets to me, and I'll worry a little bit about it, and I'll go to a you know darker place where it's like, good God, this could happen to me. And I thought I was on top of the world. I thought I was in great shape, and I thought that I was doing the right things, you know. And maybe I was, and I've been told that I was, and that if I hadn't, it could have been worse. Looking back at the day we first met, so many things Jerry said sound different now, such as this. Knock on wood, I don't think we have a history of any brain stuff. For this lifelong writer, it was a plot twist he couldn't see coming. That twist changed Jerry's own story and his heart. I feel connected to my son more acutely. I feel my time with him is more precious than it ever was before, you know, uh, and, with, and with my wife as well. What? You like this? The reality of Joe's cerebral palsy often relegates him to the sidelines, but not always. With a little ingenuity and some luck, he gets another chance. Just like his dad. You often hear it said that Alzheimer's disease is a family disease, and that is true. What scientists now know is that the disease begins decades before symptoms start. We are going to join three brothers who are on a journey to honor their father, and we're going to unlock what happened to their dad's brain in the decades before he was diagnosed. Yeah, the first one here, Howard Hospital. They are getting an early start. There is a plan. There is a plan. So let's scout out an area first. It's a day they will never forget. I'm excited. Yeah, it's going to be something. A journey they wished they didn't have to make. Home plate, Griffith Stadium, sat right here. The Klein brothers, Jeff, David, and Michael, have found home plate inside a Washington, D.C. hospital, or at least where home plate used to be before Griffith Stadium was torn down more than half a century ago. They have traveled from their homes in Atlanta, boarding planes with their special delivery package to carry out the wish of the man who was the center of their lives. First words he ever said that I heard from everyone in the family was, throw it here. It was there from the beginning, Richard Klein's love of sports, of baseball. They're one of the original franchises. His childhood was spent at Washington Senators games at Griffith Stadium, his Lutheran minister father receiving tickets for free. <laughs> Richard Klein was faithful in every sense of the word to his team. They weren't a very good team. To his wife and boys. The four boys, I called them. To his job as a federal judge. But the soundtrack of his life was baseball. Braves games, oh my goodness, he loved Braves games. We're all baseball fanatics too. Sandy Kofax, Willie Mays team ball, 81 Braves. This is passion made visible. This is just the ones that we brought. I think I've got another dozen or so back home. There's Mickey Mantle, there's Joe DiMaggio. An incredible collection by any standard. <laughs> The surprise 60th birthday for this soft-spoken man who avoided being the center of anything came not long before his diagnosis. I had the same passion for uh, uh, baseball and stratomatic baseball. And Dr. Alan Levy with Emory Brain Health Center diagnosed Judge Klein with Alzheimer's. The only foundation the Klein boys had ever known began to crumble. He'd offer me a drink and I'd say, no, I'm fine. He'd offer me a drink again a couple minutes later and then again, a couple minutes later. How Richard Klein would come to forget the game he loved most is because of Alzheimer's disease, which began at least two decades before his symptoms. The two major pathologies of Alzheimer's disease that define this are these amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles. They form in the brain decades before the symptoms begin. 
Dr. Alan Levy, director of Goizueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Emory, says that the two proteins that form the pathological deposits, amyloid and tau, are both in our brains throughout our lives, serving important functions. These are eight different brains at eight different stages. At some point, these proteins go rogue and begin to form microaggregates, seeding further deposits in the brain, and then spread like wildfire. The amyloid by itself doesn't seem to cause symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, people are absolutely normal walking right. around with a brain full of amyloid. It seems that once um, something happens that we don't really yet understand, the amyloid triggers the brain to start producing these tau neurofibrillary tangle deposits. When those, okay. when those start developing, the brain cells really become sick and the, brain connect, the synaptic connections start to degenerate. Okay. That, we think, is really the hallmark of what causes the brain to start expressing symptoms. Here is basically when symptoms began. Mm -hmm. And here's eight years later. It doesn't change a lot. No. So what that tells you is all the damage is really done before symptoms begin. Part of the challenge in cracking the Alzheimer's code is that having a brain filled with amyloid and tau does not mean you will get the disease. If you look at the brains of 100 people who have died who at death had normal cognition, you'll find that about 85 or 90 of them actually have different pathologies, including Alzheimer's pathology. In fact, we know again that many people will have the pathology of any of these by themselves and never develop symptoms. While his brain was being damaged by these proteins, Richard Klein could still play catch with his grandson years into his diagnosis. He died at 71. Oh my God. Leslie Klein is here to talk about her husband and her sons. Richard's autopsy showed not only Alzheimer's disease, but also pathologies of Lewy body dementia and ALS. It doesn't mean at all that he had ALS. We know he didn't. TDP43 is a brain protein that accumulates in certain cells in the nervous system with ALS. Lewy bodies are yet another protein aggregate, and when it deposits in the brain, it's a pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease. These Lewy bodies and the TDP43 protein aggregates often coexist in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. Scientists now understand that these and other neurodegenerative diseases frequently show considerable overlap, including ALS, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's disease, vascular dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. Aging is the obvious common denominator. A breakthrough in one area could impact all. I guess my main question would have to do with the hereditary impact with my sons. Sometimes these diseases run in, um, in families very strongly. Um, I don't see that pattern. Uh, in, ri in, ri that. in Richard's yeah, okay. situation, so I don't think your sons are at particularly high risk. All of us in, are made up of half our mother, half our father, so mm -hmm. we know that you know those genetic influencer, influences are getting passed on, but it's not in a simple cause and effect way. Um, okay. You know, by far um, the biggest thing contributing to their risk is going to be aging. You got the bag. You got the goods. Remember that special package? It contains a bit of Judge Klein's ashes. His wish was to have them sprinkled at the stadium where he came of age. Final farewell. Sprinkling where the field used to be and at an iconic oak tree that hung over the stadium. Later that day, they sprinkled more ashes at Walter Johnson High School, named for the greatest Senators player ever. He's coming with us, and uh, some of him staying at each spot. There is only one way this day, this trip, can end. The Nationals may not be their team, but this is the Klein's pastime one whose history reminds them it's not about being the best, it's that loyalty and love of a game, of each other, lives on, even through loss. And that when your dad asks you, you take him home.
One of the difficult lessons of Alzheimer's and any disease really is appreciating and enjoying our lives when we have our health. In Judge Klein's family, his boys are best friends and continue their love of baseball. And his wife is traveling as they had planned. That is how the people we love live on through us. That'll do it for us this week. See you next time on Your Fantastic Mind.